From Wondery, I'm Nikki Boyer, and this is Call Me Curious, where every week I'll get to the bottom of those funny, strange, puzzling, or just gotta know questions you have. And we'll tell you the best we can what the answer is. Cause I've got 21 questions, I've been 21 guessing, you could teach me a lesson. Call me curious, call me curious. Hola, bienvenidos a Call Me Curious. Today, we are going to get to the bottom of Cinco de Mayo. For most Americans, Cinco de Mayo is basically a spicier version of St. Patrick's Day, an excuse to booze it up against the backdrop of offensive cultural appropriation. And unfortunately, most people don't know what they're commemorating with $5 margarita pitchers at their local strip mall sports bar. So, does the 5th of May celebrate Mexican Independence Day? Or is it something entirely different? That is what we are going to find out today on Call Me Curious. And here to help me get to the bottom of this celebration is the most celebrated person that I know, my dear friend, Mr. Malone. Hi! Hi, Nikki. Hi. I am really excited about this because I, like many Americans, have always thought of Cinco de Mayo as like Mexican Independence Day, but I don't think that's what it is, Nikki. Okay. So, uh, well, I think we're going to dig into this and find out because I have to be honest with you. You're not alone, Malone. (laughs) I don't really celebrate um, Cinco de Mayo. Do you? No, I don't. But growing up, you know, in the uh, media and on TV, it was always advertisements about beer drinking and, you know, Mm -hmm. on Cinco de Mayo, you know, drinking and Mm -hmm. partying. And so that's the impression I got of Cinco de Mayo, but I don't celebrate it now. But when I was younger, I did. It was just an excuse to go out drinking. Yeah, right, right. I I think I did when I was younger too, but I I don't really celebrate it because honestly, I don't really know what I'm celebrating. And I'm trying to be, I'm trying to err on the side of caution these days and just yeah. understand the root of things before I dive in. Because when you're younger, you just go, oh, that's, that's right. what this day is. I'm in. And then you don't, if you don't understand the root of a holiday, things can get lost. Um, and then we end up kind of celebrating a more superficial version of what something is. Like, for example, yeah. Christmas. Mm-hmm. It's less about Jesus's birthday now. And it's more about Santa and presents. But right. Long story short, I don't celebrate Cinco de Mayo because I don't know <laughs> what the F it is. So maybe <laughs> maybe yeah. I should learn. <laughs> well, I want to learn because, you know, at, when you're young, you don't, I didn't really want to learn when I was young. I just mm-hmm. wanted to have fun and have a party, you know, and now that I'm older, I want to learn. That's why a show like Call Me Curious <laughs> is so great because you learn. Right. And so, I know. Yeah, you learn. So, yeah, I, I am actually really excited about this. Well, Malone, it's a good thing that we have our very own roving reporter, Dax Jordan. So he's going to go talk to the people to find out what they know about Cinco de Mayo. Hey, Nikki, I'm out here at the farthest stage at Coachella. Actually, I'm in Lancaster. And I'm here to talk to people about everyone's favorite holiday, Cinco de Mayo. Sir, do you celebrate Cinco de Mayo? Uh, I do. I do. Yeah. Are you uh, of Latin origin? I am. Yeah, I am. How do you feel about uh, the white man celebrating Cinco de Mayo? Uh, I I feel that everyone I think has the impression that it's a Mexican Independence Day. It's definitely not, but uh, what is it? Oh, it's it's a uh, it's kind of like the Boston Tea Party. Think of it like the Boston Tea Party, where it was like this is the first time we we're truly like giving it to the British. Like that was the first time that the Mexicans truly like suck it to the Spaniards. To the Spaniards, okay. Uh, where do you celebrate Cinco de Mayo? Uh, at <laughs> probably at an Irish pub. <laughs> Does Cinco de Mayo celebrate Mexico's independence, or is it the day mayonnaise was invented in Jalisco, Mexico? I'm going with number one, Mexican independence. What is your favorite place to celebrate Cinco de Mayo? A Mexican restaurant in Portland that I worked at. Or was, was Cinco de Mayo just absolute craziness in the whitest city in America, Portland, Oregon? Absolute madness. I know the beauty of Cinco de Mayo is they would hire three times the staff for the one day. It's the amount of people that got fired. <laughs> That one day. A lot of employee Independence Day the next day. Let me ask you this. Uh, did you wear a sombrero on Cinco de Mayo? Or a bandolier of bullets? 
I had a bandolier, I think of avocados because I was selling tableside guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's just good profit margin right there. Uh, do you celebrate Cinco de Mayo? Yes. There you go. All right. Uh, margaritas? Yeah, that'd be fun. Tequila shot? Uh, depending on the vibe. If other people are doing tequila shots, I probably wouldn't order one if I was alone. <laughs> the, the alone tequila shots guy is not someone you want to party with. Uh, would you be wearing a sombrero on Cinco de Mayo? No, unless it was passed out to everybody. I wouldn't show up in one. You wouldn't show up in one, but if everybody got one, you'd wear one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's part of the vibe. There you go, part of the vibe. Let me ask you this. Uh, what's the average number of margaritas pounded by a person on Cinco de Mayo? 4.3. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. 4.3. Uh, you ever try to drink a fifth margarita? You can't. You can only drink 0.3 of a margarita after you've had four. Right, exactly. And also with that tart kiss of the lime, it's too much. Oh, a tart kiss from a lime. That's my favorite seal song. <laughs> Do you guys have any Cinco de Mayo plans? I completely forgot what month that is. No, I don't. <laughs> it's like, gosh, I'm still planning 420. How many margaritas do you think you'll consume on Cinco de Mayo? Four blended a mix of mango and strawberry, <laughs> for sure. Specific. I love it. Do you know what Cinco de Mayo celebrates? Um, Cinco de Mayo is independence from the Spanish, right? Maybe we could have Sofia over. And oh she God. can teach us no, something. This is just going down. Yeah, this, she's yeah. Costa Rican. That has nothing to do. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. All right. Back to you in the cantina, Nikki. Well, Malone, it kind of appears that people love to drink on Cinco de Mayo. I, Nikki, <laughs> it's that programming from, you know, being school, from being I younger, know. you know? <laughs> Wait, I don't think they told us in school that we should drink on Cinco de yeah, Mayo. But it, I know, but it was all celebratory. Do you no, know what I, I mean? Totally, yes, I totally <laughs> Just an excuse to drink. It's so awful. Right. And I'm positive that there is a good reason for that besides celebrating half-price margaritas. And today, we're actually going to get all the answers that we could ever want about Cinco de Mayo because we have a couple of really great guests. We have the director for the study of Latino health and culture at UCLA with us. Wow. Um, but before we bring him on, our first guest is an award-winning visual media artist and television film writer. He is the creator of the syndicated daily comic strip La Cucaracha. He's a <laughs> prolific political cartoonist, the winner of six Los Angeles Press Club Awards, two-time Pulitzer Prize nominee, and recent Herblock Prize winner. He has also served as the cultural consultant on the Oscar-winning Pixar movie Coco. And he currently holds the record on Call Me Curious for the longest introduction <laughs> ever. Wow. Uh, I know. Please welcome... Lalo Alcarez. Hey, Lalo, how are you? Hi, Lalo. Hello, great to be here. So, Lalo, first of all, thank you so much for being on the show today. We're so happy to have you. I'm excited to be anywhere. Uh, <laughs> 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 I love that response. Malone, I'm feeling that, right? So, Lalo, we know that you're here to toss in your brand of humor while we tackle the history of Cinco de Mayo. And you're off to a great start, let me say. But I have to know, how do you celebrate Cinco de Mayo. Like, what do you do? Well, uh, yeah, in past years, I, I used to, you know, go to a, a, a cheesy Mexican restaurant like <laughs> Chevy's or something. Uh, or right. uh, what's that one? Uh, El Torito. El Torito, you know, yeah. And get a, mm -hmm. a, 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 you know, an artificially huge margarita and <laughs> bowl of chips and, and have some enchiladas, you know. Uh, but uh, normally I'm gigging on Cinco de Mayo at some right. event. Or a podcast. Well, kind of like know. you are now. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Gigging. I want to start calling what we do, Malone, gigging. That's I know. Cool. I love that. What are you doing? I'm gigging. Always be gigging. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so funny coming out of your mouth. Okay, so I have to know, um, what are your thoughts? When you go to these chain restaurants and you see all of these people eating out and people wearing sombreros and a little bit of the cultural appropriation that's going on during Cinco de Mayo, what do you think about that? Well, you know, to be honest, uh, when I go out to cheesy Mexican restaurants, usually on the, you know, in the suburbs of of the east side of L.A., so everyone's Mexican anyway, so right. it's not really cultural appropriation. <laughs> right. I don't get offended. Uh, I think uh, we're allowed to play with it. Uh, but, uh, you know, as, as Native people say and as Black people say and uh, as, uh, you know, Latino people say, my culture is not your costume, you know? So That it's, is oh. so, oh my gosh. It's not That's, cool. I've never heard that before. Yeah. I 
love that. I and I too. think that's a really nice way of filtering all of mm-hmm. your thoughts. Yeah. Get that get that tattooed. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I get it. So Lalo, I don't want you to go anywhere because I want to bring on our next guest who is actually gonna help us walk through the origins of Cinco de Mayo. So I wanna know the history of it, and then we're gonna dip back into what's what, what what we do modern day, which I think is really interesting. So he is a distinguished professor of medicine and director of the Center for Study of Latino Health and Culture at UCLA. Please, please welcome Dr. Hayes Batista. Hi, Dr. Hayes Batista. How are you? Hi, Dr. Hayes Batista. Hey, doing well. And you notice I got a much shorter introduction than the dean of <laughs> political cartooning. I'm good with that. Down with that. You know, it's so funny. I was thinking about that. And I was like, that's so appropriate for the show where we're like, oh, he's a doctor. But this guy. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, no shade, Lalo, by the way. I'm so happy all of you are here. But Dr. Hayes Batista, your full name is much longer than that. Oh, Hayes mm-hmm. Mendoza Barrera Valencia Bautista. <laughs> But, okay. you know, God. I'll settle for Beautiful. Hayes Bautista, <laughs> okay. as long as it's not hate you. <laughs> exactly. So, Dr. Hayes Bautista, tell us, all of us, what happened in Mexico on the 5th of May, 1862? Well, what happened in Mexico is pretty simple. There was a battle. The French had invaded Mexico. They were marching towards Mexico City. They're going to bump off a democratically elected president and install a king. And when they were about a week's march away... From doing that, they had to pass through a little town called Puebla. They thought it was going to be easy. They had a bigger army. They had about 6,000 troops in their army. There were about 4,000 in the Mexican army defending Puebla. Uh, They thought in one morning it would be over. And so on the morning of May 5th, the French zouaves with their baggy red pants charged the walls of Puebla. (laughs) And they were rejected. So they charged again. And they were thrown back again. And they charged again, and they were thrown back again. Mm -hmm. Then the heavens opened up, it rained, it drenched, and after the rainstorm passed, they were getting ready to charge again, but they realized they had been beaten three times, and instead of charging again, they did Mm -hmm. something the French army had not ever done before. They left the field of battle. They left the field of battle. Did they wave the white flag? The flag? Did they give up? No, no, they they, they didn't even do that. They just (laughs) left the field of battle. (laughs) Dishonored themselves, <laughs> went back to their camp. They were decisively beaten. So that is wow. what happened. But the question has been, and I went mm-hmm. through this when I was a yeah. kid, but that was 1,500 miles away. Why do we celebrate it here in California, particularly when it's not yeah. celebrated in Mexico? See, this is interesting. Yeah. I knew there was more Very to this. I'm so happy you're here. So this was all happening, this battle, around the time of the American Civil War, right? Yes, very okay. much around the time okay. of the Civil War. <laughs> and in fact, it... those two are linked. Okay, yeah, tell me about that. Okay, so Latinos joined the Union Army. Uh, Latinos here in California formed Spanish-speaking units of United States Cavalry, likewise in Arizona and New Mexico. Latinos supported Lincoln from day one of the American Civil War. And of course, the Confederacy expanded uh, Confederate troops marched into New Mexico. They marched into Arizona. They were at the Colorado River. They were coming at you right now. And, of course, from the very first Battle of Bull Run, the slave state army won battle after battle after battle, and Lincoln's army lost. And things were not looking good for people who supported freedom, equality, and democracy. So into this, in December of 1861, the French mm-hmm. arrive in Mexico, in Veracruz. Ostensibly, to collect a debt that Mexican, uh, the Mexican government owed French banks. Really, they wanted to expand a presence in the Western Hemisphere. And because Napoleon III was a real friend of the Confederates, he loved the slave states. He did not like Lincoln and all that crazy talk about freedom and democracy and equality. So he sent his troops into Mexico, marching towards Mexico City. Now, you had a lot of Spanish-language newspapers being published here in California ever since 1851. And they were published daily. So Latinos are reading in Spanish accounts of both what's happening in the Civil War and what's happening in Mexico, reading them in the same paper. And the news from the East Coast was disastrous. First Battle of Bull Run, Second Battle of Bull Run, all these things, defeat after defeat. Here comes the French army, apparently meeting no resistance. And a lot of Latinos think, oh, man, is this game over? So the French thought it was over until they had to go through the battle of the town of Puebla, and Mm -hmm. they were decisively defeated. 
Three weeks later, news arrived here, and it was published in the Spanish Lakers newspapers that were distributed throughout the state, and it was like a streak of lightning in the middle of a dark night. We won a big battle, decisively. Okay. So immediately when news got here on May 27th, there were spontaneous celebrations up and down the state of California and in Nevada. People going out in the streets, setting off fireworks, mm. uh, singing songs. Oh. And that was the beginning of the Cinco de Mayo. It was around the issues of freedom, yep. equality, and democracy. Basically, it was Latinos' way of saying, we have skin in this game. Wow. Okay, so that's how the celebration gets started. It seems like it's really based on the idea of hope, I think. Um, the Union Army is losing, the Mexican Army is being defeated, and the little town of Puebla fights off the French. They were defeated. They left the field of battle dishonorably. So they weren't expecting that. They, weren't, they, were, they thought that they could just beat them, beat Mexico. Yeah, yes, they, they, did. they came in with their French fashion design uniforms, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. They thought they, they were all badass. Oh, wow. and <laughs> Like all confident. They just showed up thinking that like, we got this, right? And then they and were shot. And then the, the Mexican troops, I mean, it was barely troops, right? They were like the locals. They were like the, the peasants, right? Some of them were. You had some regular army uh, regiments, uh, but also you had the local militia, and then you had the cannon fodder. So news travels, people are celebrating. It mm -hmm. takes you know, three, three and a half weeks for the information to get to everyone, right? Right. So after the initial military victory celebration, how did it evolve? Like, what happened? Okay, well, what happened? Latinos were literally so enthused about this because they took very seriously these issues of uh, freedom, equality, and democracy that they wanted to help Juarez. And to think back that Benito Juarez was the first indigenous president of, of Mexico. And all this is happening in 1863. It's, it's really wild. Yeah, so Latinos organized the first regional network of Latino community political organizations called the Juntas Patrióticas Mexicanas. That means the Met Mexican Patriotic Assemblies. To join, you had to publicly declare you supported Lincoln, you supported Juarez, you supported freedom, you supported equality, you supported democracy, and you paid the equivalent in today's dollars of $100 a month dues. Ooh, wow. that was high for back then. <laughs> yes, that was very high. Yeah, so these are very stiff requirements. Yeah. So they met every month, and every month there would be three or four speeches, and almost every speech would point back to the Battle of Puebla on Cinco de Mayo as their inspiration. So it's in these meetings that the Battle of Cinco de Mayo is talked about honored and kept alive. They just proliferated. So here you have every month people meeting and hearing about it and hearing about it. Then, of course, the next year you had the first anniversary of the Battle of Puebla. We had one here in Los Angeles on May 5th, 1863. Uh, they marched through the streets. They raised the flags, both flags, both the Mexican and the U.S. flag. Uh, there were speeches. There was a big dance that went until six o'clock in the morning. Uh, and this would go on in city after 129 cities in California, Nevada, and Oregon did this. So that's when we began the celebration. But it was a public statement by Latinos to the world. Here is where we stand on the issues of the American Civil War and the French occupation. We oppose slavery. We support freedom. We oppose white supremacy. We support racial equality. We support government of the people, by the people, and for the people. You want wow. to just chew on that for I a little did, bit? Yeah, no, <laughs> I did. I, I, I'm like, yeah, where's the margaritas come in, guys? That's a lot. I just, <laughs> wow. Wow. This is, this is amazing. There's so much more to this than I ever knew. And I kind of can't wait to hear what happens next. I need to know that it's real. Know that it's real. So tell the truth. Wow. Okay. So this holiday really has so much more history and meaning than many people realize. But there obviously has to be more to this because I haven't heard anything about half price margaritas. And y'all know Lalo has to be getting thirsty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, let me, let me fill that in a little bit for you. Okay. Okay. So the celebrations began spontaneously, 1862. After that, every month you had the meetings. They, that went on for uh, nearly six years until 1867, until Maximilian was finally captured. So that really grounded in to uh, the Latino population about the importance of the Battle of Puebla and Cinco de Mayo, not about margaritas and tacos and enchiladas, but about freedom, mm -hmm. equality, and democracy. Mm -hmm. So finally, when the wars were over, uh, 
for about the next 10 years to 1870, the veterans, and a lot of Californios, by the way, also went to Mexico and joined the Mexican army. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Mm. So for Latinos, this is like one war with two fronts. Hmm. So the soldiers would put on their uniforms of either the Mexican army or the U.S. army, wow. march through the streets of towns. They would celebrate. They started to get old and started to do as old soldiers. Their children, who had participated as kids during all this time, then picked this up by the 1880s, and they continued the celebration, and they pretty much continued the reason that it was tied to the both the French intervention and the American Civil War. But by 1900, 1910, those kids for now were getting to be 60, 70 years old, starting to pass off the scene. And at that point, we didn't have in this state anything like ethnic studies, you know, black studies, Chicano studies, Asian studies. There was not an institutional base, and people weren't writing their memoir about it. And in 1910, the Mexican Revolution uh, erupted. About a million people fled Mexico, uh, fled the violence. Many of them came here, and when they got here, they noticed people every single the mile have this big event. So these... Uh, Refugees from the Mexican Revolution came, but there was no place they could—they didn't have internet. They could look, well, why are these guys celebrating it here? Around what year was this? 1910 to about 1930. Okay. That's where you had a big wave of immigration. Got it. So that older generation that had been kids during all this died out. There was no institutional memory. Mm -hmm. So that's when the, the incoming wave of immigration brought the iconography they were familiar with, which is the Mexican Revolution. You know, La Cucaracha, the songs, mm -hmm. the mariachis the bandoleros, you know, with the bullets and everything else, because mm -hmm. that's what they were familiar with, not realizing it had nothing to do with the original origins in the American Civil War and the French intervention. That's so great. So this new wave of immigration gives Cinco de Mayo a slightly different meaning, identifying with their own heritage, but also celebrating with the Mexican-Americans because it was mostly being celebrated in America, right? In Mexico, they only celebrate it in Puebla, right? Exactly, even to this day, only in Puebla. So let me get this straight. So we're celebrating Cinco de Mayo, and the people of Puebla are celebrating Cinco de Mayo, but for very, very different reasons. Am I right? Well, and only in Puebla. They don't celebrate it in Mexico City. They do not celebrate it in Guadalajara. <laughs> but we... I mean, I, I discovered this the hard way when I was in Guadalajara <laughs> in the 1970s. I happened to be on a Cinco de Mayo, and I thought, oh, I'm going to see a really good one. So I ran out of the house, and my cousin said, where are you going? I'm going to see Cinco de Mayo. I ran down to the cathedral. I sat down. I got the best seat, and I waited, and I waited. Wow. And I waited, and nothing happened. Interesting. So if you go to Puerto Vallarta and Cinco de Mayo, they're not going to be celebrating in the streets? Actually, the uh, cheesy Drinco de Mayo <laughs> has Drinco invaded de Mayo. Mexico. <laughs> Usually oh, in the touristy spots. Cinco de drunk. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reason why my cousins say, why celebrate it? Uh, and you have to understand mm. that the difference between being Mexican in Mexico during the French intervention, being Latino in here during the Civil War, mm. is because a year later, the French came back. They had to go through Puebla. They didn't charge it. They uh, surrounded it and they besieged it. Wouldn't let any supplies, food, or water in. Finally, they ran out of ammunition, and they were able to take the town of Puebla. Then they went to Mexico City. Juarez fled. They brought in Maximilian. So my cousin said they came back a year later. They beat us. So what's to celebrate Cinco de Mayo? Oh. Got it. Wow. But up here, it was in the context of the Civil War. That, that makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. So for my cousins... There's nothing with Cinco de Mayo. We still had to deal with Maximilian for another six years. I, I, I've had uh, plenty of old white guys tell me, <laughs> well, why celebrate Cinco de Mayo? Because the French came back and oh, won. Oh, gosh. And then, but, but then I, my comeback is, well, we kicked out the French. So <laughs> That's right. who won the war? Who won the battle, right? Right. Yes, a lo largo we did. And by the way, Maximilian, the so-called emperor, was captured, tried, sentenced, and executed on Juneteenth, 1867. Oh, I did not know that. On Juneteenth. Wow. Two reasons to celebrate. My, yes. My brain hurts. <laughs> this is so fascinating. There's so much history here, right? So what was the next wave of Cinco de Mayo and the celebration as it evolved in, in the 60s? Like, didn't it become part of the civil rights movement? Well, I, it was not seen as part of the civil rights movement, at least by us. I was... Um, Part of that Chicano generation as undergrad at Berkeley, we didn't connect it in our minds to the other things that we were doing, like the anti-war movements, uh, the black civil rights, the women's rights, gay rights. We didn't see Cinco de Mayo as connected to all of that. We wanted to celebrate Cinco de Mayo as a way of saying we are here. Now, when I started at Berkeley, 
in the 60s, there were only 25 Chicanos on campus. So we celebrated Cinco de Mayo by having a salsa music concert at the Greek Theater because we didn't know this history. And of course, not knowing the history, and I was part of this, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody else. So we throw in our iconography, Che Guevara, uh, Emiliano Zapata, and the things that had nothing to do with the Civil War, or the, you know, zoot suit, low rider, suave, and all of that, or, <laughs> you know, farm workers. So that was our iconography, and the idea was we were celebrating David versus Goliath. Even though we we're a small group, if our hearts were pure, if our cause were just, we too could achieve against great odds, and that's what it meant to us. Beat the imperialists. Right. Yep, in a word. And, and you know, uh, let me jump into my uh, theorizing. Uh, the Cinco de Mayo is on, uh, obviously, the 5th of May, if you guys haven't uh, learned yet. <laughs> yet. Uh, and uh, we're in school. Like, college students are in school, and Mexican Independence Day is uh, 16 de September, September 16th. And it's hit or miss if you're in school, it's early in the semester, you don't have time to organize a, a big event or whatever. So Cinco de Mayo is kind of at the end of the school year. And, and that probably helps amplify that right. as a Chicano student mm -hmm. holiday that we saw. Well, actually, in the 60s and the 70s. Okay, well, I was all wrong. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, in a way, you're right. Because we wouldn't have just El Cinco. We'd have the whole Semana de la Raza. Sure. And we use it to recruit and bring in high school students for a whole week. And it's around issues of education, for sure. So... Gosh, it's it's funny because it morphs as every year goes by. The link to what Cinco de Mayo is, it sort of changes and evolves. And that's it's right. so interesting yeah. to wrap your brain. Maybe that's why it's hard to right? figure out. So I well. guess the big question is, which is the point of this show, call me curious. This is why we're here today. How, how did it go from all that you have described to this point? to becoming sort of a holiday for the chain restaurants and the Cinco de Mayo that we know today. Okay. Uh, and we can contrast this with Mexican Independence Day, which has been celebrated in California since uh, 1822, by the way. Uh, but ever since California then uh, was conquered by the U.S., the Mexican consul presides on Independence Day. It is a Mexican holiday, and it's scripted about what you do and who says what and who raises the flag. And the, it's scripted and it's under the control of the consul. Cinco de Mayo is not under the control of the consul. Mm, okay. And it's not a Mexican holiday. So there's nobody officially in charge. And we had these 129 juntas patrióticas. Nobody told them what to do. So each one did the way they felt. So Cinco de Mayo has been, from its very inception, sort of a people's holiday. It's not mm -hmm. an officialist holiday. It's a people's holiday. It has its good and bad points. The good point is, hey, it can take, you can take it anywhere. The bad is we kind of lost why we were doing it, but that's okay. I mean, give some, take some. Uh, <laughs> but not having a script has also, uh, it's why people forgot the origins because there was not a script. Mexican Independence Day is still very scriptive. We know exactly why we're celebrating right. it. Cinco de Mayo, we did not. And the U.S., you know, I mean, to be honest, the U.S. takes from every culture and turns it turns every <laughs> holiday into St. Patrick's Day. So totally. why why wouldn't it, the Cinco de Mayo be the, exactly the no, same as St. Right. Patrick's you're Day, right. right? You're right. So t talk to me about what happens in the 80s and the 90s, because this is when it really takes a turn here. Yes. And uh, you all may be too young to remember the 80s, <laughs> no. 1980s. We're not. We're not have no. <laughs> Ah, you young things. Uh, the 80s was supposed to have been the decade of the Hispanic. Yeah, Remember every 10 that? years we have a decade of the Hispanic. We suddenly get discovered every 10 years. <laughs> I never heard that. The 80s is considered the decade of the Hispanic. We're on our fifth one almost. Oh, I, I've got yeah. the original cover of Time Magazine. Oh, it's, very, it's very exciting for about a week. Okay, yeah. before we get too far off track, tell me what happened in the 80s. Okay. Uh, you did have significant Latino population growth. You had yet another wave of immigration. And by the way, the wave of immigration that everybody complained about when we passed 187 to stop was the eighth wave of immigration from Mexico to California, not the first, not the second. This happens on about 30-year cycles. But it did bring the Latino market to the attention of people who had goods and services to sell from grocery stores to alcohol companies to newspapers. L.A. Times, remember, Lalo? At one point, they even had a little Spanish-language insert in the yeah, L.A. Times right. in the oh, 90s. Wow. So everybody wanted to get into the Latino market. 
So one way, uh, per- particularly the food and beverage industry got into it, was by selling their products, by tying it to Drinko de Mayo. So the beer companies came in, the liquor companies came through and sort of hijacked, in a way, Cinco de Mayo, right? Yeah. Yes. That's what they did. Yeah, they, they made so. all the Latinos, they, they forced them to drink alcohol. Because <laughs> they weren't, oh my gosh. Your... <laughs> they weren't drinking it before. <laughs> mean it like that, but that's funny. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like they came in and used it as like a branding thing. Yes, it's very much branding and, you know. Yeah, that's right. You want to buy a mattress on President's Day? <laughs> oh my God, it's all about money. But see, that's why people don't know what it's about. It's because it was all in their face. All this marketing of, for drinking, it's all in their face. And remember, we did not know, I did not know, why mm-hmm. were we celebrating Cinco de Mayo? Particularly when my cousins tell me, you guys are crazy. Wow. Nothing to celebrate. Yeah. So that gets us up to the year 2000. And so here we are, right? Mm -hmm. Cinco de Mayo is happening and chain restaurants are having margarita pitcher sales. Lalo is going to be there drinking and hanging out, right? It's going to (laughs) be... Learning how to drink. So I want to be totally clear here that Cinco de Mayo does not celebrate Mexico's independence? No, it does not. It is a consequence because Mexican independence is tied to abolition of slavery and racial equality and women's rights. So Cinco de Mayo was also originally begun as a statement that Latinos supported freedom, equality, and democracy. Got it. And it stayed that way until about 1900. Then we lost it because we didn't have any institutional memory. The consul was not in charge. And, uh, you know, to me, you know, as a Chicano growing up in the 70s, 80s, uh, and, and... you know, getting politicized uh, around that time. It, it is like celebrating Mexican culture, not Mexican independence. So Cinco de Mayo, you know, people will come out and say, we should stop celebrating Cinco de Mayo because of the alcohol, because of the cultural appropriation, the white Americans wear, wearing sombreros and mustaches at, you know, and having racist parties at UCLA. No, right. Right. throwing right. tortillas. <laughs> throwing tortillas at basketball games. We should stop celebrating. Oh. And I'm like, no, we should have more. We should have, we should celebrate Dieciseis. We should ce- celebrate Mexican Independence Day. Yeah. And we should celebrate Cinco. We should have more cultural holidays, uh, not less, you know. But like I said, they do become incorporated into American culture. And uh, I've never seen Cinco so kind of integral. Uh, Now it's 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 a thing. And, and, you know, the next big holiday, Taco Tuesday. Come on. (laughs) Taco (laughs) Tuesday. That comes every Tuesday, too. (laughs) I wonder if they ever thought to make it a national holiday here or if they're still trying or for any. You know what I mean? If anyone's still trying that. No, I think we want Cesar Chavez Day as a national mm, holiday. Yeah. I think that is one yeah. that is that that's that's a holiday that would work within the framework of yeah. American holidays to celebrate. That makes sense to me. Yeah, a civil rights year. Yeah, right? that makes sense. Wow this this was really fascinating. As I feel like I learned so much about Cinco de Mayo, and and I got to be honest, I I feel okay to go out and celebrate, but not appropriate the holiday. I mean, it's kind of an American holiday from what you told us. It never really belonged to Mexico. No, it belonged here. Yeah. And it's a civil rights commemoration. So we've been celebrating every year. We do an event at La Plaza de Cultura y Arte. I do speeches. I do uh, seminars reminding people it's about civil rights. And the issues have as much resonance today and importance as they did back in 1862, as you mentioned, Don Lalo. So how would either of you like to see... Cinco de Mayo celebrated and commemorated. What would that look like? Well, for myself, uh, again, uh, I like it the way it's evolved as a cultural celebration. Uh, we we need more of that. We need more knowledge about you know. Uh, to me, Cinco de Mayo has always meant, like I said, as as a performer, as I used to do comedy, I would get gigs on Cinco de Mayo because that's like the one time they want to uh, you know, like here today want to hear from us, right? So, so you don't like, find at all any of the current celebration at all disrespectful? Well, I'm talking about, you know, uh, us, our community, my community, celebrating it. It would be great to see more cultural pride, more interest in, you know, folkloric dancing or the music of Mexico mm-hmm. or all this history. I would love to see more of that, not less. Of course, 
I, you know, it, there's a limit to uh, cultural appropriation, and and when it goes from respect to mockery, that that's not cool. So I would hope that uh, we would get away from the the cultural appropriation of people drawing uh, fake mustaches right. and wearing sarapes yeah. at frat parties, and just get back to the cultural roots of it. Yeah. And Dr. Hayes Batista, what about you? How would you like to see it commemorated? Well. I take a look at 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody thinks, okay, hot dogs, uh, barbecue, baseball, and it has something to do with, oh, Declaration of Independence. So, yeah, I've got nothing against a good party. (laughs) Um, But I would like for us to remember why we're having the party. Now, uh, we do our teatro, our reenactments uh, of the first Cinco de Mayo, uh, I participated in parades. I was the Grand Marshal of the Pasadena Civic Pride Parade oh, about eight years ago, and it's on Cinco de Mayo. And I took a picture that I'm going to be showing in Mexico in two weeks, because Mexico also wonders, why are you guys celebrating? And for me, the picture I took was iconic. There was, in the picture, a lowrider. Next to it are some little 10-year-old kids dressed in the Mexican Revolution costumes, and next to them, an Aztec dancer. Now, in Mexico, you would never see those elements right. together. Right. Here, it's common. So I want to show folks in Mexico, but this is us. Yeah. We're Latinos de Estados Unidos. This is how we do it. So I have nothing. I'd like to see parades. I'd like to have parties. But I'd want us to remember that these are basically all begun by Latino support of civil rights. Got it. Freedom, mm-hmm. equality, mm-hmm. democracy. And it is, um, those things are so important today, as important today as yeah. they were 150 years ago. Like Very yes. American values. We're, Very holding down, we're, we're holding down the fort over here for you, Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like I learned more than I ever did in school just in this time today with both of you. Thank you for clearing the air about Cinco de Mayo, giving us other ways that we can celebrate that aren't offensive, right? Like that aren't about drinking and and celebrating something we don't even fully understand, no cultural appropriation. So I feel empowered. I feel excited. And um, I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Hayes Batista, for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting. And Lalo Alcarez, such a such a treat to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I got to get back to drawing. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so funny. Malone, wow. So I know what I'm not going to do and what I am going to do on Cinco de Mayo, don't you? I know, me too. I learned so much from this. This was really great. My head's spinning a little bit right Uh now. I really need to take some time to process everything I learned, but I'm glad I learned it. Oh, Malone. Oh, it was so nice to be with you today. Adios. I I love you, Nikki. Bye. Bye. Cinco de Mayo has a complicated legacy. But just to be clear, no, it does not celebrate Mexican Independence Day. That actually happens on Mexican Independence Day, September 16th. Although Cinco de Mayo is still celebrated in the modern city of Puebla as a day of victory, for most Mexicans, the holiday is of minor significance. For many Mexican Americans, the day holds a special significance as an opportunity to celebrate their shared heritage. However, due to the commercialization of the holiday, mostly by big alcohol companies, many Mexican-Americans are conflicted about celebrating. And for Americans without Mexican ancestry, it seems like a great time to have a drink and learn a little more about the history and culture of Mexico. Okay, that's our show for today. Hey, tell us what questions are on your mind. Send us a voice memo, or you can email us at callmecurious at wondery.com. Or you can even hit me up on Instagram at Nikki Boyer. I would love to hear from you and get to the bottom of all your questions. Because I don't know stuff too. From Wondery, I'm your host, Nikki Boyer. Our theme song is Tell the Truth by Yana. Thanks to Mr. Malone for joining me on today's show. And thank you to our guests, Dr. Hayes Batista and Lalo Alcarez. New episodes drop every Thursday. Rich Goodman is our senior producer. Polly Stryker and Gary Lucy, producers. Our associate producer is Jayha Joshua Chang. Our editor is Steve Mazur. Scott Velasquez, music supervisor for Freeze on Sing. Dax Jordan was our person on the street. Sam Ada and Danny Bringer are our engineers. 
And Tina Rubio and Marshall Louie are the executive producers for Wondery. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. And remember to stay curious.